Hello everyone, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Simone and I'll be hosting the session today. I'm the community manager with the OED team and I'm delighted to be here with Megan Bushnell. So now, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Megan so she can properly introduce herself and begin her presentation. So Megan, with you now. Oh, great. Well, thank you very much, Simone. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Megan Bushnell, and I'm a DPhil student at the University of Oxford in the English faculty. Uh, I work on Gavin Douglas and his translation of the Aeneid, uh, known as the Enneados. So today, I would like to talk to you about how the OED can be used to investigate the implications of Gavin Douglas's lexical choices in the Enneados. This uh, is a case study that was developed from a series of meetings between the Oxford English faculty and the OED. And I would like to thank both bodies for facilitating this research. I'd also like to thank James McCracken, uh, my colleague at the OED, who helped me on this project. Uh, today's this talk will not yield any hard conclusions about the nature of Gavin Douglas's Lexus. Uh, rather, the aim is to show you how this work can be conducted, its limitations and its potential. So to that end, this talk is uh, gonna be organized in this way. Uh, first, I'm going to tell you about how the case study was conceived and implemented. Then I'm gonna present some initial results and some tentative interpretations. Uh, I'll then turn to a general reflection on this method, um, what worked, what didn't, and where we can go from here. And then I'm gonna finish with a brief discussion about what this all means for the study of Gavin Douglas. So let's get started. So as I said before, my research concerns Gavin Douglas, who was a late medieval Scottish poet and cleric who became heavily involved in Scottish politics after the Battle of Flodden in 1513. Now the first half of his adult life was devoted to his advancement in the church and is also when he wrote his major poetic pieces, namely the Palace of Honor and the Enneados. However, after the Battle of Flodden, where most of the Scottish nobility were wiped out and the Scottish King James IV died, Douglas became far more politically active and wrote very little. And it was during this time that he became the Bishop of Dunkeld. Of course, as is often the way with very political people, as we've kind of been seeing, uh, his political adventures eventually landed him in trouble. Uh, and he was exiled to London in 1521, where he died not too long after. Uh, from plague, as, as was often the way back then. Now, Douglas is typically identified as being a Scottish macker, which is a group of Scottish poets from the 15th century who greatly developed the poetic capabilities of Scots and were influenced by uh, vernacular poets like Dante, Petrarch, Chaucer, and Lydgate. In fact, um, Chaucer's influence is so pronounced that these poets have been referred to as Scottish Chaucerians in the past, although this term is now disfavored as it suggests that these poets were only imitators of, Scott, of Chaucer, uh, which rather minimizes the importance of their own innovations and contributions. Uh, indeed, um, the scholar Gregory Kratzman acknowledges that the Scottish tradition uh, had a very different character from the contemporary English one and even outshined it at times. Now, Douglas is uh, very typical of this tradition in a lot of ways. He is a master of the Orient style, which utilizes obscure Latinate vocabulary and complex stanza forms to ornament the text. However, at the same time, he makes great use of Scott's uh, acoustic qualities and alliterative verse to mimic the frenetic quality of storms or battle scenes. Uh, he makes use of dream visions and complex allegories, but also typical uh, Scots genres like flighting, uh, which is a highly energized exchange of poetic insults. Moreover, he is highly elusive and referential, and not just to Chaucer and the classical tradition, but also to other Scots poets. However, Douglas is also unique in this tradition in some ways, especially when it comes to the Enneados, which is the main focus of my research. Uh, the Enneados is the first full translation of the Aeneid in either the English or Scottish tradition. Now, by translation, I mean that it is based directly off the source text, unlike Chaucer's account of Dido in The Legend of Good Women or Caxton's Enneados, 
which are adaptations and also the source for um, a lot of Douglas's sort of rancor uh, in the prologues to the Aniados, he points out these two uh, translations or rather adaptations as examples of things that you shouldn't do with the Aeneid. So that's what I mean by translation. Now by full, I mean that it translates the entirety of the Aeneid, uh, unlike the later translator Henry Howard, Earl of Surrey, who only translated books two and four. Uh, this translation is also groundbreaking in its thoroughness. Uh, not only does it translate all 12 books of the Aeneid, but it adds a 13th for good measure, uh, which is translated from the supplement, which is by the Italian poet Mafio Veggio. And the supplement is essentially kind of a fan fiction work. Uh, the Aeneid ends on a very jarring note, and the 13th book just kind of brings everything together and gives it a, and they all got married and went out to dinner kind of happy ending. Uh, aside from this 13th book, Douglas also prefaces each book with an original poem, often discussing a theme that he feels is important to the book it precedes. And in addition to all of this, Douglas is an extremely careful translator and creates a remarkably faithful translation. Now, while he claims in his first prologue that he does not translate word for word, his practice is so scrupulous that you can, in fact, cross-reference the translation nearly word for word. And this rather undermines a lot of Douglas's comments uh, describing his translation. And my research is trying to figure out what exactly his method is, how did it come about, how does he conceive it, of, well, how does he conceive of it rather, and what does it all mean? Now, part of this endeavor involves understanding what Douglas thought about his language and how he felt it needed to be manipulated to translate Latin effectively. Now, not only is the Eniados unique in its method, but it is also notable for being one of the first instances where Scots is used as a linguistic identifier. Other mackers only use the term Scots to indicate geopolitical identity and otherwise refer to their language as English or English. And this is even the case for more explicitly patriotic poets like John Barber and Blind Harry, who wrote poems set during the Scottish Wars of Independence. Uh, as you can see from the examples here, you've got Barber and Blind Harry on the left, Douglas on the right. Uh, Barber compares Scottish and Englishmen only in terms of their nationality. Uh, similarly, Blind Harry uses uh, the term Scots as an adjective related to governance, uh, again, indicating political allegiance. However, when it comes to English, he relates it to words like tongue and Latin, uh, indicating that English can, is in, uh, English can designate language as well as nationality. Uh, by contrast, uh, Douglas explicitly claims to use the language of the Scottish nation and distinguishes this from English by comparing his work to Caxton's, who is of English nation and writes a book of English gross. Uh, in this way, he gives the term Scots the same capabilities of English to be used to refer both to national identity and language. However, uh, like his comments about his translation practice, Douglas also contradicts himself a bit about the nature of his language. Uh, while laying claim to the title of Scots, Douglas also admits that his language is not pure Scots. He admits to some Anglicization, explaining how he pronounces some words as his neighbors do. Moreover, he admits to utilizing a range of loan words from French and Latin to expand Scots lexical capabilities. Uh, that he did so, and that he performed such a meticulous translation, proved a boon to later linguists like Franciscus Junius, who used Douglas's work to uh, help compile a Latin to Old English dictionary. However, while old linguists like Franciscus Junius appreciated uh, this variety of vocabulary, many scholars, uh, usually from the 20th century, attribute to this lexical variety a sense of difficulty that has resulted in Douglas being studied uh, less than other Scottish mackers like Henderson and Dunbar. Um, they uh, recognize that he not only uses Lexa's source from different places, but from different times, and that he generally favors obscure words. And it's these various aspects of Douglas's language, his translation method, his linguistic declaration, his variety of Lexus and his difficulty, uh, it's these aspects that all seem to stem apart from other Scots mackers and raises several questions. 
Namely, is there a specific reason why Douglas declares that he writes in Scots when others do not make this distinction? Is there a linguistic justification for it that perhaps is tied to, to his variety of language or his translation needs? And how unusual is Douglas's language really when compared to the other Scottish mackers? Now, these are just some of the questions that I've been pondering over the course of my research. And for a very long time now, I have felt that a statistical analysis of etymological variation in the Scots mackers might help illuminate these issues. However, the ability to tag for etymology in a corpus of older Scots literature has not been practically feasible until now. So as part of my research, I've been using corpus linguistic methods to analyze the mechanics of Douglas's translation. And a big part of this effort has been to make the Eniados into digital files. Here is the workflow for how these files were made. Uh, I won't go through every step in great detail, but um, broadly, I took David Coldwell's Scottish Tech Society edition of the Aniados, which is available online through Lion, and then I transformed it into a series of Unicode files, uh, which I used to initially explore the text and to implement alignment between the Scottish translation and the Latin original. Along with alignment, I included layout annotation and pragmatic annotation, and then I shifted the files to XML. Once in XML, these files were normalized uh, and then tagged using the USAS tagger. Now, normalization was achieved through a semi-automated process. I manually created a normalized word list uh, using the OED as the standard for normalization, and then I used an SED code to provide normalized forms for all the words in my files. Uh, sometimes a modernized alternative was also offered along with the normalized variant uh, to help bridge the gap between, the med between medieval Scots and the USAS tagger, which is meant to be used for modern English. So words that are no longer extant would also get a modern synonym selected by consulting the dictionary of the Scots language. Uh, once normalization was complete, I then would check every file uh, to find and resolve errors. Once normalization was complete, uh, I then generated a version of the text that could be read by a modern tagger, and I ran it through USAS to get the semantic and part of speech tagging. Uh, again, some manual checking was then required uh, because even if the vocabulary has been um, adapted to be used to be uh, recognized by a modern tagger, the grammar is is still not what standard modern English grammar is. So then this information uh, was combined with the original files and combined with the alignment information to create a final version that has layout annotation, pragmatic annotation, alignment information, normalized variants, and grammatical tagging. Now, in addition to these files, I also have a corpus of work by Scottish mackers that I compiled during my master's degree at the University of Manchester. Now, this corpus uh, comprises of originally seven authors, uh, the Scottish mackers Blind Harry, Robert Henderson, Walter Kennedy, William Dunbar, Gavin Douglas, and Sir David Lindsay, uh, along with Chaucer, who was included for comparison. Uh, the corpus was originally balanced by author, with each author contributing approximately 10,000 words of text each. However, as many of the original Douglas files are now part of the Eniados digital files, I've largely removed Douglas's share of this corpus and have digitized the entirety of Douglas's other major poem, uh, The Palace of Honor, to be considered separately. Now, I updated these files so that they match the Eniados in their level of tagging, uh, barring pragmatic annotation and alignment information, which were not appropriate for these files. Now, these files originally existed only in Unicode, and they had two versions, uh, those with the original orthography and those that had been normalized using BARD. I took uh, these two versions of these files, and I added layout annotation, and then I put them into XML. Uh, I then aligned the original version with the normalized version 
so that they could easily be recombined. Uh, and then I also double checked the normalization in the normalized files. I then ran the normalized files through the USAS tagger uh, and combined them with the originals to create uh, files that have layout annotation, normalized variants, and grammatical tagging. So these files, combined with the OED's resources, uh, made it possible to create what is effectively an etymological tagger. For, as I'm sure you're all aware, the OED includes not just the definitions of over 600,000 words, but also offers an analysis of each word's etymology and a corpus of quotations tracking their first occurrence. It also has a decent coverage of Scott's vocabulary and clearly identifies regional vocabulary and forms. Recently, the OED has been in the process of developing a parser that simplifies OED etymologies to make them easier to process en masse. Using this parser, it was possible to find simplified etymological information for every word in my digital files, along with information concerning their etymons and first usage. And this flowchart shows how this was done. Uh, so first, I would provide my files to James McCracken, uh, my associate at the OED, and he would transform them into Excel spreadsheets, uh, which with each word and its normalized form and grammatical information extrapolated from my tagging. James would also generate a separate lexicon for every author in my corpus based on when they were alive in order to create a possible catalog of what words they might use. James then lemmatized all the words in the files based on their normalized form and part of speech. He would then look up the etymology of each of the lemmas in the author lexicons previously prepared. From this, uh, the Excel spreadsheet was populated with each word's source language, etymon, and whether the word was an author-specific coinage. This information could then be fed back into the XML to become part of the file's tagging, although this has only been done with the source language information so far. So that's essentially what we've done. Uh, I'm now going to show you some results from a few tests I ran to explore the data. Uh, please keep in mind that this, uh, these results are very preliminary and they require more work and nuancing. Uh, they certainly can't be used to draw any definitive conclusions about Douglas and his language use as of yet. Uh, but they will help to illustrate the capabilities of this work, uh, what needs to be improved, and where we can go next. Now, the main thing that this etymological tagging allows us to do is quantify each author's use of words from certain sources and compare them to Douglas's word use. Now, this was done first by eliminating any words that are only of grammatical import that were sure to tip the results overwhelmingly in favor of Germanic etymologies. So to do this, I excluded any words that had a Z category in the semantic tagging. So these categories include proper nouns, discourse particles, grammatical particles, uh, negatives, conjunctions, and pronouns. I also further simplified a lot of the etymologies. Many of the words listed were given multiple etymologies, and I would arbitrarily pick one. Uh, usually the one that was less represented in the data, so like Celtic, Greek, and Dutch. So the initial results indicate some interesting differences between authors, uh, especially in their use of more obscure source languages like Celtic, Greek, Hebrew, and Spanish. Uh, we see especially Walter Kennedy, who's in purple, has a fairly large presence in um, Celtic etymologies and Hebrew ones. Uh, and this is not really surprising, uh, given that Kennedy was from Carrick, which is a Gaelic-speaking region of Scotland. In the flighting of Dunbar and Kennedy, uh, Dunbar mocks Kennedy for his knowledge of Gaelic, which was considered a lesser language than Scots at the time. So it makes sense that as a Gaelic speaker, or at least someone who was familiar with Gaelic, uh, more Gaelic loanwords should pop up in his poetry. Uh, the one we see him use especially is crag, as in a steep or precipitous rugged rock. That Kennedy should also make use of Hebrew is also not strange, considering his poem, The Passion, was all about the crucifixion of Christ, and it took place in Jerusalem. So he often refers to Jews, which has a Hebrew etymology, and also to biblical creatures like cherubim. 
If we turn our attention to another source language, uh, we also see that um, if we look at Greek, for instance, we see that Lindsay here in the dark green dominates in his use of Greek, though uh, all of Douglas's works also make use of Greek as well, or at least his uh, prologues and the Palace of Honor, his prologues in blue, Palace of Honor in orange, are also fairly substantial contributors to this, this category. Uh, and Dunbar as well here in the turquoise. We also see that Douglas is very unusual in that he is the only author to make use of Spanish words here in the, uh, we see here with the Palace of Honor especially and a bit less in uh, the books of the Eniados. So he's the only author to make use of Spanish words, words like renegade, for example. Uh, however, while this all looks very exciting, it must be admitted that these differences are very minor. And if we flip the graph and we look at the results by author, uh, we see that each author has largely the same distributions of etymologies. Uh, so a lot of words of Germanic origin, uh, a lot of Latin, and then about equal amounts of Old Norse, uh, French, and English. Now, while the p-value uh, listed at the bottom of the graph uh, indicates that these results are significant, uh, the amount of data being handled here is so large, um, over 150,000 data points, that it's likely that almost any result would have been significant. Uh, this is a weakness of the chi-squared test, uh, as it only measures the amount of evidence available to substantiate a claim rather than the strength of the correlation. To test the correlation, I used a uh, Cromer's V-test, which values the correlation from zero to one, with one being exceptionally strong. Uh, as you can see, again, at the bottom of the graph, uh, the test yielded, in fact, a very low number, uh, 0 0.04, which suggests that these authors do not especially vary in their use of etymology respective to one another. Of course, this is just a very general look at the data, and there are many ways that this data may be further examined to reveal nuances in each author's use of lexical sources. Thanks to the tag in my files, source languages can also be analyzed by their grammatical and semantic distribution. They could reveal who is using Latin more in nouns, who's using Latin more in verbs and adjectives, uh, and also who is using them in unusual uh, semantic categories. I've started doing this research, uh, but so far it's uh, not yielded anything uh, particularly uh, of, of note. It's basically saying the same thing this is, that there are some minor differences that are significant but have low effects. But again, there's, there's more work to be done. Now, other information that the OED can supply is uh, whether a word is a coinage for the author using it. Uh, as these results show, uh, Douglas does stand out uh, in the uh, amount of his coinages, uh, especially in the Enneados. Uh, only Dunbar comes near to uh, his quantity of coinages, although Chaucer outstrips them both. Uh, and perhaps it's this aspect of Douglas's vocabulary that readers are responding to when they feel that Douglas is especially different or difficult in his lexis. But again, there are further things that we could do with this to, to understand what's going on. We could evaluate how often authors repeat specific coinages and whether their coinages are of Germanic or Latin origin. We could also track the grammatical and semantic uses of these coinages and try to identify what part of speech and semantic categories they prefer. Uh, this would help build on work previously done by Lilo Musner and John Corbett. The most important thing, however, is the fact that we can easily see where coinages are occurring and are enabled to analyze their contexts. And this will give us greater insight into the function these coinages serve in Scots and Scottish poetry. So I'd now like to spend the rest of my time uh, reflecting on what was done here and how well it worked. I'll be considering the efficacy of the tagger in general and then specific problems caused by various processes in the etymology, in the, excuse me, methodology. Uh, finally, I'll posit a few ideas about the value of this work and how it might continue. So in, uh, in evaluating how effective the tagger is, the first obvious measure is how big the coverage of the tagger is. 
in our case, this tagger had very good coverage with only 1% of results coming back as uncertain or blank. However, 1% of such a big data set still equates to almost 2,000 words, which is no small amount. Now, we can't really do anything about the uncertain etymologies, as these are etymologies that the OED has been unable to determine. So it's up to the lexicographers to revisit them and see if anything can maybe be done. Uh, on the other hand, though, um, the blank etymologies can be remedied, as these are usually the results of uh, glitches in the methodology. So in some cases, like chatter, uh, it's because the etymology is onomatopoeic and it doesn't seem to have been properly analyzed by the parser. Uh, in other cases, uh, like command, it's because the etymology entry doesn't actually say clearly where this word comes from. It implies a French origin, but doesn't actually go out and say it, which I think is why the parser maybe couldn't recognize it. Uh, however, for other words like chill, which is from Old English, the reason for the lack of result is unclear and it needs further investigation. So basically the parser still needs further development, but again, uh, 99% cover, 99% coverage is pretty good. Uh, but what about its accuracy? So in a graph you saw previously, the results seem to suggest that the Scottish Mackers and Chaucer were very similar in their use of linguistic sources. Uh, however, this is a somewhat troubling result when we consider how Chaucer is an author distant from the Scottish Mackers in both time and place, and we might expect a greater difference between them. Uh, before we say that this tagger is ineffective, however, let's consider what it's failing to capture here, what difference it's overlooking between these authors. And the weakness appears to lie in the broadness of the categories, especially the Germanic category. Now, Scots, like English, is descended from Old English, but from the Northumbrian dialect. Consequently, while both Scots and English use a lot of words that are of Germanic origin, uh, the forms of these words that they use are different, uh, like how older Scots uses distinctive QUH forms for relative pronouns. While the OED is very scrupulous about identifying alternative word forms as being Scottish, this information is not part of the etymology, so it's not included uh, in, it's not I read by the parser, and it's not included in my results. Similarly, the OED is very good about observing when a word is unique to Scottish vocabulary, but this information is conveyed in the region section of the entry in the OED and not the etymology one. So again, the parser doesn't read it, it's not part of my results. If we were to develop this process further, I think it would be worth exploring how uh, the information in the forms and region categories uh, could also be mined to enhance etymological categorization and make this a more powerful tool for investigating Scots. Uh, at this point, however, um, this tool probably shouldn't be used for the comparison of Scots to English, or at least to effectively prove any similarity or difference between them. It's much better for looking at uh, where people are getting their words from outside of Germanic. So it's really good for looking at things like a Latin borrowing. Now, alongside the various glitches that sometimes prevented words from being a source language, there were other hiccups in this methodology that resulted in words being categorized incorrectly. Some of these were issues on my end, uh, especially when it came to the normalization and tagging. Um, I like to think that the normalization is very thorough, uh, but there are certainly some errors in it, uh, especially when it came to selecting homonyms. Uh, for example, there are a few occasions where instead of normalizing a word to feign, uh, as in glad, I selected feign as in to pretend. And aside from this just being incorrect, uh, this is a problem for the etymology, as the adjective feign is from Old English but the verb feign is from French. There are similar incidences in the part of speech tagging. Um, overall, the USAS tagger copes remarkably well uh, with the more flexible word order of older Scots and poetry. However, sometimes it does miscategorize a word's part of speech. 
Uh, manual checking usually rectifies this, but it is not infallible and some things slip through. A particularly humorous case is uh, with the word mixes. Uh, this is obviously a third person singular form of the verb mix, which is a French Latin borrowing. However, the tagger on one occasion identified this word as the plural form of the noun mije, uh, which is an indigenous tribe in Mexico and has a Spanish etymology. So clearly that's wrong. It's very unlikely that the Scottish authors were going around uh, talking about indigenous Mexican tribes. Uh, aside from these occasional mistakes, there are also some more insidious repeated errors that are due to the gap between older Scots and the USAS tagger. Uh, sometimes the tagger was able to recognize an older Scots word without the need for a modern variant. However, it still would misidentify the word's meaning because the word had several meanings available and the tagger would always pick the most modern one. So a good example of this is the word cast, which in the context of older Scots, uh, almost always means to throw, as in, you know, the idea of you cast a stone or you cast your line when you go fishing. Uh, however, the tagger would always recognize cast as in um, to cast an actor for a role. So this resulted in cast often being assigned uh, the semantic category K4, which is drama, the theater and show business, instead of the more prosaic M2, which is putting, taking, pulling, pushing, transporting. So as a result, sometimes I'd get uh, very interesting data results coming in that suggested that my authors were always talking about the theater and, oh, isn't that exciting? That I'd go and look and see, oh no, they're, they're not talking about that. They're talking about, you know, throwing spears or, you know, attacking one another. Uh, so it, it would just be something some, sometimes a bit misleading. And what makes it particularly difficult is that it's really hard to anticipate these kinds of problems because these words are not uh, something that you think would cause obvious problems for the tagger. You think that the tagger would very easily recognize them uh, because the human brain can recognize that a word can have multiple meanings that are dependent on context. However, the computer's brain is not yet able to capture this nuance. And in general, this is just a problem that I think everyone is going to encounter in one way or another who works in the digital humanities. There is always going to be a gap between how the human brain um, conceptualizes things and how the computer's brain does. And it's not always an intuitive uh, thing for us to realize. So it's something that I think everyone will have to recognize and try and create inventive solutions for. So along with these issues, there are also sometimes some errors in lemmatization, uh, which affect the etymological output, uh, especially when it comes to the selection of homographs. So an example of this is the word mold, which can mean soil or earth, but can also mean shape or form. However, the word's etymology uh, differs depending on the meaning. So mold, meaning soil, is Germanic, but mold, meaning form, is Latinate. Uh, in addition, there are some words that do not have an etymology listed in the OED, uh, usually Scottish words like thud, as in a strong wind or storm, or gousty, which means ghastly. Uh, these words have entries in the OED, and they are recognized as Scottish, but they do not have an etymology listed. Um, in addition, there are some words that don't have an entry at all. Uh, and these are usually Latin names like Aeneas or very obscure Scots words like Chippenuti, which I believe is some kind of goblin, uh, although I know the jury, it's, it's, it's a bit unsure. Uh, so in these cases, it's not that surprising that the OED doesn't cover these. The OED can't cover everything, although I know it tries really hard to. However, in one case, it was really surprising that there's a gap in the OED. Um, my colleague James McCracken pointed this out to me. Apparently the word should does not actually have its own entry in the OED. It's listed as an inflected form under shall, even though should and shall are both modal verbs and thus don't carry tense. Uh, luckily we were able to recognize, the, recognize this issue early on and uh, we were able to give should a, an etymology, uh, but it was, it was just a, a, a funny thing to notice. And hopefully in time, the OED will go back and revise this uh, to give should its own entry. And in this regard, uh, this project 
was not only helped by the OED, but was able to also give something back, both by helping to debug the, the parser, but also to indicate gaps in the dictionary's coverage. So those have all been kind of little uh, sort of technical difficulties that we've been wrestling with. Uh, but there's also some more sort of challenging theoretical problems that we also had to deal with that had an effect on our results. So we had to make a choice whether to adopt the immediate or ultimate source of uh, a word's etymology. Uh, ideally, we want to adopt the immediate source relative to the Scottish mackers. Uh, however, it's really hard to know uh, whether an author borrowed a word from its original language or via another language, uh, and whether the author was able to recognize the word's ultimate source regardless. Um, so we took the ultimate source as a rule for the sake of consistency. However, there are a few cases, um, especially when it comes to, to Greek, where that just seems really unlikely. Uh, so, for example, we have the word white, uh, which means a person or creature, which originally came from Greek. However, given that this word entered Germanic by a Gothic and was already a part of Old English vocabulary, it seems very unlikely to me uh, that the Scots authors will have recognized this as a Greek word and not as part of their native vocabulary. Um, we caught white's anomaly fairly early on, so white is now labeled as Germanic, uh, but other words like uh, Barrett and blasphemy slipped through the radar. Um, these words are also originally Greek, but are also present in Old French, uh, which is a much more likely borrowing source, in my opinion. Consequently, uh, a lot of our Greek results are probably not that Greek at all, uh, which is somewhat disappointing. Uh, although it is still possible that the author recognized that they had Greek roots and that that affected their choice in using these words. Uh, in any case, there were so few Greek results anyway that this really hasn't made a significant difference to the overall distribution of the data. I mean, Greek is still a very, very small source for these poets. Uh, however, it does make comparing authors based on, on their use of Greek more difficult. But in general, this is the case for most of the errors here. Uh, the data set is so large that the statistical impact of these occasional errors is minimal, and I do have faith in the accuracy of the majority of the results. Uh, a more serious consideration uh, in the validity of this research, I think, is um, just the fact that it's the nature of this tagger and the OED's etymological parser to simplify the etymologies in the OED. Now, this is necessary in order to make the results countable on a grand scale. However, the unfortunate effect is that a lot of nuance is lost when you do this. And for this reason, uh, this kind of analysis is best for getting a sense of the general picture. And it always needs to be corroborated by detail-oriented analysis as well. That being said, there is still a lot of value in the research this kind of tool can produce. Uh, on the linguistic end, this tool could help provide an overview of the etymological sources for older Scots. Uh, and such work has already kind of been done by Carolyn McAfee and Alan Anderson in 1997, but they did it by manually taking a random sample of the dictionary of the older Scottish tongue. And this tool could really help update their results. Um, the data generated from the process of normalization and tagging could also potentially be used to make an automatic normalizer and tagger specifically for older Scots, uh, which could help facilitate its study. On the literary side, this tool could help indicate whether Douglas's use of etymology is stylistically conditioned. Uh, it can help us figure out if his use of Latin is confined to Orient passages or if he expands Latin use, as many have suggested. Uh, this tool could, of course, also be used to examine all the other Scottish mackers. I think could be a very useful addition to uh, existing medieval Scots corpora, like the Helsinki Corpus of Older Scots. So to conclude for now, I just want to finish up with a few comments about what the results shown here might indicate about Douglas. Uh, to start with, I think it, too much is sometimes made of uh, Douglas's uniqueness in the canon. Uh, and I think this really has a lot to do with the fact that Douglas isn't really taught as often as the Scottish mackers. Now, there are a lot of practical reasons for this. Uh, Douglas's poems are very long and dense, and they're really hard to fit into a syllabus. 
especially if you're not teaching a course specifically dedicated to the Scottish Mackers and you're just trying to slip one in, uh, usually Douglas is not the one you're going to pick. Um, also, Douglas works at times in different genres from the other Mackers and he sets himself apart in a lot of the ways I've I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation. And the result of this is that Douglas is considered especially difficult and unique in the canon. Uh, but what these results kind of suggest, although they do need uh, sort of more investigation, it suggests that while Douglas is unique in some ways, he shares a lot more with the Scottish Mackers than the narrative has necessarily expressed. Um, as C.S. Lewis has noted, uh, Scott's poetry is distinguished by its variety of language. Uh, so it's not something that's especially unique to Douglas. They all borrow a great deal. It's just what's unique about Douglas is just that he makes more of a song and dance about it in his prologues, uh, and he's sort of better at self-promotion. So if that's the case, then what is it then that people are responding to when they read Douglas and they find him especially difficult? Well, again, I would say that has a lot to do with how Douglas depicts himself. Uh, he likes to make a lot of claims in that first prologue of his about what his translation is, what his language is, who he is. And the problem is that people tend to focus a lot more on the prologues to the Enneados than the Enneados itself, uh, because the prologues are just a bit more fun, they're a bit more wacky, they're shorter, they're just a bit more approachable. But the result is that sometimes people take his claims at face value when, in fact, I believe that there's a lot of finagling and he, he plays a lot with how he is presented as a poet. Uh, but then again, we do see with his coinages that he does uh, coin a lot of new words and that could be something that people are reacting to because they keep on uh, encountering unfamiliar vocabulary that they have to look up. And sometimes it's not even the fact that the words are new, sometimes it's just that they're rare, or sometimes it's just that they're being used in a way that is unusual, like they're in a different part of speech or semantic category or context. Uh, and these are all things that the tagger could investigate further. I think there's also just the fact that Douglas was working in a highly technical and difficult genre, uh, translation, which necessitates the knowledge of another language to study, and even at times relies on the interplay between languages to make its point. And this alone makes his work somewhat intimidating and especially lexically overwhelming, uh, as the implication is that it's not just his vocabulary that readers are digesting, but Virgil's indirectly as well. And even in The Palace of Honor, which is not a translation, Douglas's highly elusive style is sometimes an obstacle. Uh, while alluding to classical myths or biblical stories is common to most of the Mackers, Douglas really raises it to the art of um, almost parody. Uh, <laughs> He has whole passages in the Palace of Honor uh, that are basically catalogs or obs of obscure figures from myth, religion, history, philosophy, and literature. And um, these serve to illustrate uh, his high level of scholarship and just how clever he is, which is you know, something Douglas loves to point out to people. Uh, but as a result, it also makes his work a bit inaccessible as people, students are constantly forced to you know, dive into the footnotes to look up who these people are. So in that case, uh, when Douglas claims that he's doing something unusual or when he claims that he's writing in Scots, it probably doesn't actually indicate that he is doing something exceptional with his language compared to his contemporaries and predecessors. Rather, I think the fact that he works in translation has forced him to become incredibly conscious about his language use, almost pedantically so, and more aware about the differences between his language and that of his English counterparts especially between his translation method and that of his English counterparts. And he very much wants to separate the two and kind of carve out a place for his Aeneid, uh, which is a Scottish Aeneid. Anyway, we're going to leave it there. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Uh, before we go to questions, I'd like to acknowledge a few people who really helped this work. Uh, I'd like to thank all the people at the OED who helped make the webinar possible. Uh, especially James McCracken, who of course worked with me on all of this, but also Philip Durkin, who helped consult at the beginning, uh, Emily Hoyland, who was there throughout the process and really helped bring it together, Rebecca Clifford, who was the first person to suggest that I do this webinar, and of course uh, Simone, who's 
you know, been running the webinar and putting it all together, and she's done such a great job. Uh, I'd also like to thank my supervisors, Sally Mapstone, Martin Wynn, and Helen Barr for their invaluable guidance. And also just a quick shout out to uh, Susan Rennie, who introduced me to Franciscus Junius and really opened my eyes as to sort of the linguistic impact Douglas's translation had. Uh, anyway, thank you so much for your attention. Sorry to go on. Uh, are there any questions? Thank you very much, Megan. That was very interesting. And yes, we do have a couple of questions that came in through the chat. So the first one I've got here is, why did you not use VARD when normalizing the ENEADOS files? Uh, that is an excellent question and something that I really want to address. Uh, so Scottish orthography is famously inconsistent. Uh, and often one spelling form can be used for multiple headwords. Uh, which sometimes makes training VARD very difficult. I mean, my method of doing it by hand also had the similar problem because you could only assign one normalized variant to one spelling. Uh, but basically, I, I just kind of felt that if I had to train VARD on the Scottish variants anyway, I might as well just do it all on my own as it is. VARD wasn't really going to save me any time. And in fact, I did use VARD earlier when I first created the, the Scott Chalk corpus. And I really had to spend a lot of time going through revising this tagging. So to me, in this case, it just VARD felt like it was just going to be an extra step uh, in being just yeah another tool that wasn't really built for older Scots and so needed to be adapted for it. So that's why I didn't use it for the Eniados files. Thank you. And there's another another question that came in through the chat as well. Why didn't you use the Helsinki corpus of older Scots? Uh, well, I suppose it's my corpus, the one I built in the Masters, was the one more available to me and I was a bit more uh, acquainted with it. It was also just the case of my corpus had the text that I needed. Uh, I've, I'm always at heart a literary scholar, although I, I did do my master's in linguistics. So I've always been most interested in looking at literary texts. And while the Helsinki Corpus of Older Scots is a phenomenal res resource, it includes a wide variety of genres and that are mostly uh, more non-fictional and not as literary. Uh, so I really wanted to just focus in on the Scottish mackers because the fact is poetic language is often very different from you know prosaic language, uh, so if it didn't seem quite right to compare Douglas to you know court cases or letters, it seemed more appropriate to compare him to other poets. There is one question just came in. You said OED clearly identifies regional vocabulary. What were the labels you used? Uh, you mean the the labels that the OED uses to uh, well, if you look in the, if you look up uh, sort of Scottish specific words in the OED, it will often say in the region that it's it's Scottish, or sometimes they'll say especially northern usage. Uh, sometimes I think they'll even try and specify the region of Scotland, but generally it's either Scottish or northern. I unfortunately did not have the uh, foresight to think about using uh, those labels. I was just kind of interested in getting the etymological information. But if we if we do at some point try and figure out a way to incorporate the information from the uh, regional categories, uh, then I'd use uh, the same labels that they have, Scottish or Northern. Uh, I probably wouldn't try and uh, go any uh, more in depth than that. Oh yes, there is something else that came in. Just a comment, I'm very much persuaded by the general nature of Germanic as a category. Are you going to address it somehow in this project or later work? Uh, I don't think it's really going to be something I'm going to address in this project. Uh, I think it's definitely something to look into for later work. Uh, um, this particular project, this case study, I think uh, it's it's not actually going to really fit into the narrative of my thesis so much as uh, there's, there's a bit too much already there and uh, I'm on the verge of finishing. But this is definitely something I'd like to explore further because I, I think it could be a very useful tool. And then I definitely want to work with various people about 
what ways we could maybe make the Germanic category a bit more descriptive, because at the moment it does just seem to swallow a lot of content that I think would be very, very interesting. Uh, and it gives us that really weird result suggesting that Chaucer's just like the Scottish Mackers when he's not. Uh, everyone who's read them knows that they're very, very different uh, and that there's, uh, it's at the moment having a result like that could be potentially damaging even because then people who don't know might just try and lump them together and treat them the same. So it's definitely something that I think needs to be I think that is the first thing I'd want to do if I were to continue this work and evolve this tool further. I'd want to uh, really work on making Germanic a more useful category and splitting up into smaller ones. But I still am not quite sure how that would work. Again, my, my best idea is try and uh, use more of the information from the regional labels and from the forms. Okay, thank you. And. Yes, it looks like there is another comment coming in. Um, did earlier critics of Douglas feel he was difficult because they were coming from the English tradition and perhaps not that familiar or, or uh, tuned into Scots? Uh, I mean, I think that is perfectly possible. And I think that is a general reason why his translation has not really gotten that much attention uh, because uh, even though it is, you know, the first one in both, you know, the English tradition and the Scottish one, uh, it seems that he's not really read uh, because they're a bit intimidated by his vocabulary. Although interestingly enough, I mean, he was first published when, when uh, his work was printed, it was printed in England, uh, but then of course also heavily anglicized and also heavily edited to for a more Protestant audience. So no, I definitely think you're right there. That has a lot to do with who's reading him and where they're from and what they expect. So again, thank you very much for the presentation, Megan. That was very interesting. And thank you everyone for attending. I hope you enjoyed it. I certainly enjoyed it. From us for now, goodbye.